be shifted to another day? And what about the security of materials already distributed to local government areas in some states? Is this the first time that election of this magnitude has been postponed in Nigeria? Now, these are some of the questions we intend to put forward to our guests as we discuss the developments pertaining to the general elections. This is Nigeria Decides on the network service of the NTA, the largest TV network in Africa. I am Cyril Stober. You're welcome. And joining me in the studio to analyze the developments on the 2019 general elections, we have uh, AIG Moses Jitubo, AIG Investment, Nigeria Police Force Headquarters, Abuja. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. All right. And also here, let me introduce Ibere Ifendu, election observer and analyst. Good to have you. Thank you. All right. Now, to kickstart our discussion, we'll take this statement by the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Mahmoud Yakub, on the postponement of the elections. Of the implementation of its logistics and operational plan and the determination to conduct free, fair, and credible elections, the Commission came to the conclusion that proceeding with the election as scheduled is no longer feasible. Consequently, the Commission has decided to reschedule the presidential and national assembly elections to Saturday, 23rd February, 2019. Furthermore, the Governorship, State House of Assembly, and Federal Capital Territory Area Council elections are scheduled to Saturday, 9th March, 2019. This will afford the Commission the opportunity to address identified challenges in order to maintain the quality of our elections. This was a difficult decision for the Commission to take, but necessary for the successful delivery of elections and the consolidation of our democracy. The Commission will meet with key stakeholders to update them on this development at 2 p.m. on Saturday, 16th February 2019 at the Abuja International Conference Center. Well, that's the statement postponing the elections. And so, what are your views about this development? Ah, well, it came as a huge surprise because um, I kept repeating that uh, they put everything on ground for the election. And I remember, you know, had several uh, interviews where the INEC chairman and then several meetings also with the INEC chairman, he kept repeating that they were ready for the election. So when this happened, it was a huge surprise, considering that observers came from outside the country, even from within. We have also, you know, put out our own logistics to be part of the elections. And then with this, I, honestly, it will affect so many things. Let, 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 me, let me just extend this further. Yeah. As late as midnight yeah. early last morning, night, early morning, <laughs> lots of people were calling in mm. because the social media had been awash with all kinds of stories that it had been postponed. Yes. And uh, there was actually a statement that had been issued earlier by the Director of Voter Education of Vianek, and uh, a number of people and... Uh, the convention, the traditional uh, 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 media, had sent out these statements to so many people who were, you know, inquiring about the, you know, the credibility of these rumors about postponement, yeah. Yeah. and that there was no such thing. Only for a few hours later, um, again, uh, this has dealt a, a knock to the traditional media, as we know it as they're saying, right, right, the true news out there is coming from the social media. So we wonder, how is it that just before the postponement was officially announced, yes. the whole country was awash with rumors of a postponement? 
Okay, let me say that the conventional uh, media will definitely not issue out a statement unless it's coming from the right source. But yesterday, uh, at about 10, 11, we started uh, feeling it because there was this kind of um, a meeting happening in INEC. And then when things like that happen, people will begin to speculate. So the social media can actually do that and nobody will hold them accountable. But NTA, of course, can never you know, announce something that is not coming from the direct uh, mm -hmm. source. So uh, the conventional media shouldn't feel bad that the social media took the announcement away from them. They were just being cautious. But the truth is that you know, if you are in politics or part of election monitoring, by 10, 11, up to midnight, we were already feeling it. Because they kept telling us to hold on, there will be a breaking news. So we were wondering, breaking news. Of course, the social media will pick the breaking news oh. to mean whatever they want it to be. For some people who have been reacting to uh, the statement issued by the INEC chairman, yes. so, well, if there were logistics and uh, other problems, uh, it is assumed that these were uh, in some states. And the question they'd asked us, is it not possible to go ahead and then postpone only in those states that had those challenges? Would, would, would that have uh, uh, dented the, the, the whole of course, system? Of course, it would have. It would have because um, we are not having a scattered election. This is supposed to be a general election taking place in all the states. Uh, but what I uh, will say is if INEC had informed the media to be part of this uh, logistics uh, thing that they were doing, you would have known ahead. And then we we'll begin to you know, even be the ones to suggest that if we're having this problem, Problems. Can we move this election? But they you know, insisted that they put everything in place to have this elect very fair, credible election. I'm quoting them now. Okay, so what happened was that media were not involved. They were also not tracking the logistics of moving things. So um, we can't have elections in some states and have uh, some later. Mm -hmm. That would taint the uh, elections because... It, it will be seen as, as if, you know, it's a political time. The two major political parties will be having this feeling. If you go to this A party uh, stronghold, they will feel, oh, it was done because of one or two things. So I think, yes, the decision to have it done one day is okay. But at the same time, we need more explanation from INEC. All right. Well, let's come to AIG Jitubo. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot was put into the security arrangements in the build-up to the elections, which, well, as we now know, will no longer hold today. And the first thing to wonder about is what happens to all the security arrangements that had been put in place. Yeah, thank you very, very much. As far as the, the policy is concerned, we, we have this motto, that, uh, the, this Boy Scout motto, that be prepared. Mm. We have been prepared since. If the election starts today, we are ready. If it starts tomorrow, we are set. Even next week, we are most ready. The boys, the, the men deployed will still be where they are and continue to secure. Not only the, not only the, the, ANEC, uh, the, the ANEC issues, but also lives and properties. So we are ready. You know, some of the issues that will, might be raised, uh, there, there are sensitive materials, non-sensitive materials. And as I said last night, these materials had been distributed to states and local governments. And people are wondering, with this distribution already taking place, how would the security of those materials be guaranteed uh, for another one week? The fact that they are very, very important materials, that makes our work more uh, serious. That means we have to put more attention and, and, and do more work. I was in MENA yesterday to supervise uh, the state, mm -hmm. and uh, I, was, uh, I made sure that uh, the INEC materials were taken to the CBN, and everything was uh, done in accordance with all security guidelines. So the fact that uh, the, the, the election has been shifted makes no difference to the police. Right. What about the deployments that you had already Deployment done? Deployment still stands. Hmm. They are there to do their job and, and to be seen to be doing their jobs. So deployment still stands, work continues. Do you foresee any upscaling of the arrangements that have been done? All? It's just okay this way. Have you been able to, in deploying for uh, the now postponed elections, um, observed certain areas which you might have overlooked? And um, do you have the benefit of now, now that, that it's been postponed, do you have the benefit of uh, uh, knowing one or two areas to plug in? That gives us more advantages now. 
to block all the loopholes that we may not have seen before. Because even before now, arrangements have been made uh, pre, during, and post elections. Mm. So with that, our boys, are, uh, the, the boys are in place, everything is ready. All right. Well, let, let me return to you. Would it be that uh, Anik underestimated the magnitude of what was before them? Yes, I think so. You know, like um, yesterday I was discussing with one of um, the observers that came from outside the country, and he told me that in his country election time, usually they have about 15 million registered uh, voters. And then coming to Nigeria, we have 84 million registered voters. It's a huge number. And then considering the logistics of going to some of the riverine areas, the terrain, you know, with some of these things, I neck didn't think it would be an issue for them to send this because they, from what they said, they had uh, involved um, aircraft, air force, and all the um, other agencies. I think the police also, you know, to help them with in you know, transporting of these things. But from what I also heard yesterday, that if we go to the airports, then we will see some of those things there. And then they had issues again of moving some uh, uh, things to like a state in Ogun State, and by the time you get to Ogun State, you find that what is there is actually meant for Bauchi State. So I want to say that they were overwhelmed, considering the number of voters. Hmm. You see anything about the late announcement of the postponement? Um, Someone would have said, like you said, you said so for many observers, yeah. there was a feeling that something was at miss at about 10.30, 11 yeah. last night. Do you think in circumstances like these, the election management uh, uh, body could have come out and said, look, let's take the country into confidence on this matter, um, rather than leave it to just about when people were beginning to wake up early to proceed to their voting centres? Well, I think uh, the INEC chairman actually was trying to see if there was something they could do to remedy the situation. I mean, taking this decision, I don't want to believe it was just an easy decision for them to take, having put so many things in place. So I want to believe that all through the period they were waiting, they, maybe they will use that to see if they could you know, do something with the logistics, if they had uh, a way of being able to uh, um, send out the materials. And it got to a point where they realized that it was no longer going to be possible. So mm -hmm. they had to come out to announce to the public. I want to tell you that INEC actually tried and I believe that um, it's a matter of not you know mm -hmm. understanding the number of um, logistics or you know transportation and things to do with the materials that cause this problem all right well, well let me come to AIG uh, Jitubo yes you say whether it's postponed or not your arrangements still remain in place but we are aware that you had huge, massive, massive deployment all over the country. Are you in touch with all your units, especially in remote parts of the country? Are they aware? Well, you know, is there any chance of anyone of your operatives saying, well, it's been postponed? Um, let's uh, take a breather. In the police, and I'm sure in other regimental uh, uh, institutions, there is what we call the standard orders. Right. And, and the standard orders come from the Inspector General of Police mm -hmm. himself. As long as the standard order has not been given, the work continues with all the men stays in their duty post. Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, even, uh, we even have a... Uh, maybe I may drop uh, this list to you. To the boot, to, for every boot, the police, the names of the policemen who are there are, and their, and their phone numbers are here are made. I will drop it here for you because we want to ensure that uh, the police is accountable mm. and we are accountable and everything goes well. And in conjunction with other security agencies, I think uh, we don't have uh, much problem because uh, this is not the first time we have been doing, doing elections. We have learned from a pre from previous ones, and even in this uh, particular election, mm -hmm. so much trainings have been done. Each policeman has his own uh, guide, 
mm -hmm. which uh, he uses. So he's a, he's abreast with his, his duties because of the trainings. Okay. And uh, with collaboration from other security agencies, um, I think it will be seamless All this right. time around. Uh, well, the, the, the policemen themselves, they have this. They're acquainted with this, which is referred to as a guide of, uh, yeah. Police okay. on electoral duty. Oh, police officers on electoral duty, standard operational guidelines. And yes. They know that. Is the public aware of uh, such a guideline? They may be, be aware, but since it's the professional duty of the policemen, right. it is their duty to know okay. what, and uh, they are all about their duties to be professional. Right. I'm, I'm looking at a situation where um, if by any chance any of your men on duty happens to cross the line, uh, members of the public would know what to do and where to go to? Yes, I think phone numbers uh, they, they can all they can always reach the uh, the, the state uh, PPROs and uh, lay complaints. Even as, as we're talking, we see have, apart from uh, the local and international observers, mm. the police itself has its own ele electoral uh, monitoring team, mm. which goes round. Mm. And uh, we have, we, we see have the, the the electoral investigation team also in, in case of uh, the offences. The the standard of uh, the election is that much powers are given to the uh, the electoral officers. Right. So the police will now, let's say there are some, some operas and so, the, once the electoral officer identifies one or two people who causes uh, some breaches, mm -hmm. he now instructs the police, the police now, now makes a race. Now that uh, the election is, is now holding, the policemen will still be on on duty until just like just like I said, there's a standard order. So All, right. All right. So the polls won't hold today as earlier envisaged. Uh, it's been put up by one week, but then it's still the period, and we thought we might refresh your memories about what it is and the voting procedure. So we bring you the special report on the voting procedure. They may not look rich or live in choice areas in town, but they are the kings in this prestigious time, that is, in the election period. And this piece of technology is the reason behind their prized status. This is my liberty. Possessing it is one thing. Utilizing it properly is another kettle of fish. Seven steps are required in the voting process, but how informed a day. The first step is to go direct to, I think, a few or three that can accredit you. So for you go to the polling unit with your permanent voters card. If there's a queue, you join the queue. Uh, first official will check to look at your card and see whether it's actually your card. Then we will ask for your biometrics. Your fingers will put onto the aperture to confirm. So if you're past biometrics, you will now go on to get a ballot paper. Then you go to the cubicle where you will vote in secrecy. Then you come out, you roll it again, flatten it, and you come out and you drop it uh, in the open, basically. In moments like this, fake news is having a field day. For instance, my mobile phone was inundated with messages from friends requesting to know whether INEC has directed the use of a particular finger for voting. And this news has already gained currency. This is the, this is the one that is being used, but it has now been changed to this very particular one. Now we have 73 political parties contesting and the uh, boxes in the ballot uh, paper are slightly smaller. So uh, whichever finger that the voter is comfortable with, he or she can use. Mere Ogede, NT News. All right, uh, we've just been joined by Dr. Sharif Gali Ibrahim of the Department of Political Science, University of Abuja. Thanks for being here with Thank us. Thank you for having me, sir. Right, we all know now that the elections have been put on hold. Mm -hmm. It's a one week postponement. Mm -hmm. What are your impressions about that? Uh, well, the postponement of the elections uh, uh, is a surprise, you know, not only to me, to Nigerians, because nobody ever expected it to happen. Uh, but it is gradually becoming a tradition because we could remember that the 2015 
presidential elections or general elections per se were also suspended. You know, you come down to uh, the Republic of Congo, you know, elections postponed. So I think it's an emerging trend in Africa and uh, Nigeria is not an exception. But again, uh, we, this portends that our institutions are still weak because uh, we shouldn't really, uh, on the eve of uh, the elections, we count on you know, unforeseen you know, contingencies or issues that we have not really viewed before. So I think it's uh, as a result of uh, uh, the existence of weak institutions, a lack of proper preparations, you know, earlier than now, uh, that really degenerate to causing this particular or such postponement. But again, uh, Nigeria is a versatile country, you know, as we know. Uh, we might have some intervening variables that might really uh, intervene to have caused such postponement. Uh, yesterday, I've been following uh, you know, the events that have been unfolding throughout the country. Uh, you know, security issue is also a major factor uh, because uh, we know what happened, you know, in Kaduna State, uh, about 66 killed in Kaduna State. You know, some terrorists nabbed in uh, a Bonyi State. You know, a vehicle was uh, also discovered sorry, discovered in Zamfara State, in Kano State people were arrested. So, you know, we have, we've had a myriad of issues, security issues, that were, you know, arising, you know, as a result of the prepared elections, you know, for today. So I think security is one. The logistics, delivery of, uh, you know, uh, electoral materials, especially in some state, uh, or some local governments, for example, Niger State, Oyo State, you know, River State, and other significant uh, state. Uh, so I think these are also, uh, you know, issues. But INEC should have prepared for these things, you know, before now. The, you think we had asked? We had asked uh, a very uh, this question earlier. You think that? INEC underestimated the magnitude of what was ahead of it? I think it did. Mm. Because if, if we should have some materials missing in some state, we should have some materials available to be able to replace at least voting materials for a whole state. And as a matter of emergency, INEC should be able to liaise, you know, with other institutions for easy delivery of such materials in a place discovered such materials missing. So I think it underestimated, underrated the magnitude, you know, of Nigerian state as well as level of electioneering processes in the country. It's about 20 years now since uh, uh, we started on this. And the question is, in 20 years... We we'll still have this postponement. You say it's a it's a trend in in Africa. Yeah. What does that say? Yeah. Uh, that it 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 portend that we are still backward democratically and politically because uh, we don't see this in advanced societies except you know uh, you know with a great and drastic uh, exception or reason. And that is why I argue that we have seen what happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We've seen what really unfolded in the 2015 general elections and is still, you know, uh, been a trend, you know, in the 2019 presidential elections. So I think we should grow beyond this particular postponement, postponement. If we decide for a date, remember, if you are to postpone elections, postpone it maybe five, four, three days before, not until a day before elections, meaning you have underestimated, you know, you had really negated the political milieu, you know, the, the, the institutions, you know, that will actually put hands in deck to make sure that the delivery of this electionary process as well as the elections, you know, is well fulfilled. So I think INEC 
uh, did not really carry out a kind of uh, futuristic survey to making sure that uh, the elections are well conducted in due time. Let, let, let's just for, for one moment um, leave out INEC and <laughs> concentrate on the electorate. People were right, they were primed to yeah. go out and vote. Yeah. And suddenly, this came like an anticlimax. Yes. And uh, how do you think that would affect the whole process? You think that uh, the same, you know, fever pitch readiness that we saw just before this postponement, you think we would see the same thing in about a week's time? Or do you think, in some way, um, uh, some 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 voters might just lapse back into you know apathy and say, well, we we can't keep doing this all the time. Yes, you're very correct. Most people traveled out of uh, Abuja and their different stations to where they registered to vote. You have to put into consideration the financing of those trips. So if they come back after a week, I do not see so many of them traveling back again to vote. The people in Abuja, or maybe the people within their areas of um, voting may also not feel interested because some people will start feeling that the vote really will not count. So why would I go out to vote? Why would I do that? These are some of the major issues that this postponement will cause us. If you know we had the election today, we may maybe let's assume that uh, over 70% would have voted or 80%. Next week, the 23rd, I do not see a huge number of people coming out to vote. It will affect them. There's going to be serious apathy. Nobody will believe. Most people actually will think that their votes won't count. Don't forget that with this postponement, people are having different readings into it. Mm -hmm. Some see it as truly INEC having a logistics problem. He talked about security. I wasn't looking at it you know, from the security angle because we got commitment and reassurance from the IG. And from what uh, AIG just said, now uh, you will know that the police on their own part put everything in place to have a successful election. But from the angle he brought the security thing, that's a problem also. So I want to believe that this postponement will affect uh, the nature of people coming to vote. You just raised an, uh, an interesting point here. No one is quite sure about the real exactly. reasons behind that. The INEC chairman has said, that uh, uh, we'll be holding a meeting with the major stakeholders, the parties, later on today. You think this period, I'm seeing that meeting at about noon, later no, today? 2 p.m. today. Two, okay, 2 o'clock. All right. Between now and 2, knowing the Nigerian nature, what do you think would be happening? What do you think are the kinds of things, the speculations that will be going around within this period? Well, you know, for politicians, they are going to be having uh, meetings, strategizing, um, analyzing uh, the reasons for the postponement. They will come up with their own uh, beliefs. Some of them will believe that it was done in good faith. Some will believe it, was, it wasn't done in good faith. I'm just wondering what, you know, will be the outcome of this. Because by the time they meet 2 p.m., we'll now get a clearer picture. Some have said... Would it not have been better if INEC had held this meeting with the major stakeholders, the parties, before it made the announcement? Yes, of course. Uh, that would have been better yeah. because when you like opt other people, all people that are involved, there will be that particular peace of mind and trust built as a result of that. That's true. But with the absence of the other stakeholders, such as political parties, then there could be suspicion that INEC might be trying to align itself with one party or the other in order to rig elections. Prior to now, as we discussed, uh, a party was even alleging that the INEC was, you know, in connivance trying to rig the elections. So failure to include the political parties on board in divulging this particular trend, it might raise uh, another you know, aspect of suspicion that INEC, you know, is trying to manipulate. And secondly, the integrity of the government of Nigeria in the eyes of the foreigners, even the foreign observers, might not be happy with this particular development. Because, you know, the presidential aspirant came to Abuja to sign the peace accord. 
And uh, the opposition party uh, asserted that he received a phone call from the Secretary of State of United States of America, all in making sure that elections are conducted freely and fairly in the country and make sure, make sure that we accept the spirit of peace and peaceful coexistence among ourselves, whatever might be the result of the elections. So all these stakeholders, people that need to be, needed to be informed, were not informed prior to this particular disclosure. So what do you think? You are paving a way, you are leaving a kind of a vacuum for people within and outside the country to suspect the whole electoral empire, you know, as an institution that is charged, you know, to conduct free and fair elections in Nigeria. So as she said, there is going to be a high level of resentment, even from the electorate, electorate, you know, even the officials, you know, that are connected to the conduct of these particular elections. And that, by a large and by extension, uh, might definitely result in political apathy because of the financial capability of those who had already traveled to exercise their own franchise in their various states. Now, talking about financial capacity, yeah. are there economic implications with regard to this postponement? Um, I'm looking at a situation where, in advance, announcements had been made about the restriction of movement for 12 hours. Yeah. Um, businesses had uh, made, you know, had closed in anticipation of this restriction. Uh, some people had had to cancel or postpone certain things. And uh, now it's not really happening, is it? Yeah. Naturally, it will affect uh, so many people economically, especially the traders and even um, businessmen and women. The truth is that we've all made arrangements for today. So you're going to uh, see that after today, by next uh, weekend, we are doing the same arrangements again. And then after that, for the gubernatorial elections again. So these are things that will affect people you know, financially. And you know our culture, we do most of trading and getting you know, a little money by the day. So we have stopped people from earning today. We are going to stop so many of them from earning another two, three days for the ones that will be you know, traveling back from wherever they've gone to vote. So this is a huge loss to the community, huge loss to the country, huge loss to the voters and the general public. Uh, Dr. Yali Ibrahim. <laughs> what do you say uh, about Well, it? of course, if you critically look at the political economy of elections, you know, you definitely, as she submitted, that people will be at loss because people budgeted, yeah. you know, for the presidential and gubernatorial. So now people are going to experience, you know, unplanned and unnecessary budget. So how do they raise it? People already, you know, uh, the month has gone far, okay, today is 16th, and uh, a fortnight ago, people got their salaries, and now they expect another fortnight before they get another salary. That is for civil servants, those who work. And there are those that are engaged in businesses, they have left the business locations, you know, travel home, you know, just to exercise their own franchise. And now there is a dislocation, there is a kind of a... a, 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 a uh, you know, uh, uh, everything uh, being, I mean, destabilized, not according to their original plans. So definitely it will affect the budget of the common man, you know, who is expected to vote, uh, you know, during the elections. So I think this is a setback engendered as a result of the postponement announced by INEC. All right, we'll return to other implications, but let's come back to uh, AIG Jitubo. Well, as you said earlier, there's no difference to uh, uh, the lead security agency, and that's the police, whether it's a postponement. You say even if the elections were to go ahead right now, the police is ready. We would like you to take us through your security arrangements once again, since in just about a week from now, we'll be going through the same thing. So let's refresh our memories about how prepared you are. Yeah, thank you very much. Just like, as, as, as I said earlier, firstly, we, do, we did the uh, trainings and training of the men because, one, the men must know 
their functions and their and their duties. So as a, as of uh, before now, they were ready, and we are ready. They they are they are to report 5 a.m. at their polling booths, at all polling booths and centers, or all, all centers of uh, all centers of electoral values. They are to be there by 5 a.m. and receive uh, the voters. And for every uh, uh, every polling station, there is there are three there are at least three security men, police, and maybe some or some other uh, other security agents where we are thin out. Mm -hmm. So, and the, once once the report, they will stay there and maintain security, not only to the voters but also to the uh, the INEC officials. Wait, they are to be firm, strict, and cordial. Courtesy demands that uh, they should respect the dignity of uh, the human. After voting, it is expected that the, the, the voter should uh, leave, should, should give a space of, of about 300 uh, meters, because we know that each voter want to see the, the result. And in that kind of places, at that kind of time, there is, uh, there is the attendance is to be some kind of uh, opera. So the police is uh, have, they have been trained to to curtail that, and the policemen on on duty are not ex expected to bear arms. Mm. They are they are to, they are to be civil, not to bear arms. The arms carriers the arms carriers are some are they are located in, in, in the places where they can give a rapid uh, uh, rescue. So, what we're trying to say is that both the police, the both the police, the voters, and the and the officials are secured. Mm -hmm. Well, as of last night, um, the instruction was still out there about uh, on the restriction of movement, and uh, I, I suppose that with the postponement, that automatically. Uh -huh. <laughs> there must be a lapse. <laughs> yes, because I'm sure even while I was coming, I saw the place where they, they were, the place where they all everywhere was still uh, being policed. Well, as right. I was coming, okay. they, but uh, before I I got in cars, I started uh, uh, moving on the road because of the mm -hmm. the postponement. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, well, we uh, uh, we know that a similar thing would be in place in another one week from now. Yes, we are set. All right. Well, let's go back to you. We're still talking about the implications here. Some educational institutions had to shut down yeah. because of these elections. What happens to them now? Uh, of course, that uh, uh, reflects on the extension of the days, you know, for resumption. And uh, I have seen also some universities had already rescheduled their calendar. Uh, University of Abuja and many other, you know, intellectual uh, learning institutions, they had now rescheduled their calendar, academic calendar, you know, for the next semester or session. So you can see that this automatically has been affected. And uh, for primary, secondary schools, you know, uh, not an exception, okay, their own calendar has also been touched. So I think uh, the postponement does not only affect civil servants, does not only affect businessmen, does not only affect educational institutions, but rather affect all people from all walks of life. So I think this has a greater, a greater implication, you know, to our own society, uh, because shifting calendars might really cause a spillover. You know, spillover effect. I mean, uh, the effect you see here might multiply. It has a multiply effect because. It extends from the education, from business, from civil service, you know, even the security, you know, because now those located, you know, in a particular location, though we have security personnel, you know, in these various states, but if you deploy a security personnel in an area where you're supposed to spend maybe one week, and now you extend the, the stay over there, Definitely, the 
level of preparedness must also be connected to financial extension because the initial budget also has to be extended because you cannot keep a policeman in a place to spend two days and he's to spend four days now meaning you have to multiply it so it is adding in the cost as well as the expenses of the elections so not only in education not only in businesses civil service even the security well, perhaps the yeah, you would <laughs> respond to that you envisage additional uh uh, financial implications uh, with regard to your deployment? Definitely that one will come, but uh, <laughs> the job first. We must be seen to be doing the job, so we will do the job. Right. <laughs> well, it's still, it's still on the implications. <laughs> yes. and, uh, and he's just talked about schools that would have to reschedule resumptions and so many other things here. Yeah, generally, there's no aspect of you know, life that will not be affected. He talked about the police spending more money. We are also going to spend more money as um, the public, general public, you know, going to vote. And it has also eaten into our time, our schedule of so many things. So many people plan to travel. You know, some people planned already, they got their tickets immediately after the gubernatorial elections, they'll be traveling. Now they'll have to readjust. So generally, everyone will be affected, you know. And uh, again, the major concern for me is going to be the credibility of the elections. Now, let, 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 let me put this to you. Do you imagine that now that there's a one-week postponement, do you imagine that the parties will go back to the field? Naturally, they will go back to the fields. But the major concern now, believe me, is the credibility of the elections. This will affect it. No political, any political party that, you know, uh, uh, will lose this election, ordinarily, maybe if it had taken place today, would have accepted. But after this day, they will begin to look at loopholes to find what this helped, uh, how this helped the other political party. So the credibility of this election is going to be tainted seriously with this postponement. Believe me, as politicians, I know how they think and what they do. So for them, they are no longer losing because people didn't vote for them. Whoever will lose this election will lose because it was postponed and another opportunity or a kind of, um, uh, how do I put it now, uh, maybe a kind of uh, support, you know, from INEC to a particular police, uh, a political uh, party. These are some of the things we'll be listening to this, uh, as the days go by. So generally we will all be affected. And do you envisage any kind of realignment or, as we just said, the party is going back to the campaign since, uh, well, technically speaking, um, they still have some more time. Uh, uh, you know, going by the Electoral Act of 2010 as amended, you know, elections were supposed to have closed since yesterday, mm -hmm. especially for the presidential mm -hmm. and for the gubernatorial 1st of March. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, with the extension, uh, uh, we should have, though the Electoral Act did not foresee such postponements. Exactly. Right. So therefore, <laughs> so there is no, no any additional days, you know, for campaigns. Uh, the only thing will continue because all the rallies, the state campaigns, you know, you know, have ended, you know. So definitely, uh, that is the holistic. Now, you know, see, I'm problem. asking this because if a politician decides to mm. go out today and campaign, mm. would they be in breach? of the electoral guidelines because they said 24 hours before the elections. Yep. The elections are not taking place. <laughs> have not taking place. <laughs> but so, like, yeah. so therefore, we should look at the eve of the rescheduled period. Since yeah. the electoral act presupposed, you know, a day before the election day. So therefore, I will intervene. I say if the electoral act or all the necessary institutions that are connected to these elections should really allow the candidate to continue campaigning until the eve of the presidential elections, you know, as expected. Then another thing she raised is that, you know, somebody just scheduled for a week and pay for hotel accommodation. Now extension. He's going to pay double of what he had already, you know, scheduled. Then apart from this, we have foreign observers sponsored by either the African Union, the mm -hmm. economic community of, of, I mean, of West Africa, you know, other European observers. There was a budget set aside for them. So now they have to apply again 
for extension as well as addition of what they were originally set to really spend. So it has a great implication. I would you know, if, if, if the elections were to affect maybe two or three local government, you know, we could have just overlooked them, you know, because Nigeria is a complex state. Nigeria is greater than, you know, any one or two local government, even though they are part of Nigeria. So, but, you know, the implications, the repercussions of not conducting the elections will be greater than ignoring one, two, or three, or even one state, you know, mm -hmm. a kind of. So I think uh, it's unfortunate, and uh, Nigerians, as well as... Uh, the international community, uh, you know, have not been expecting this particular trend. But as it comes, definitely we have no other option, you know, than to really accept the situation and hope it will be for the best for us. Right. As we await the outcome of uh, uh, the meeting with the political parties at 2 o'clock, as we await the outcome, when perhaps we would get to know the details of uh, why the elections were postponed. What do you think INEC should begin to do now? Well, I think uh, INEC um, should begin to reach out to the stakeholders, to the general public. They need to bring out more information so that people will stop speculating. Um, they should work more closely with the conventional media. You know, like you said uh, when we started talking about the social media, uh, for some of us, you know, when we received the first message, then another person posted fake news, considering uh, the level of fake news that was right. circulating. So people got confused. I tell you that most people didn't know about this postponement up to this morning. Uh, some of our observers were calling for us to give them information, even though we had posted on the WhatsApp uh, group that uh, there's been a postponement. But, you know, information don't travel as wide as we think it does. So the INEC should be working now more closely with the media, trying to tell the general public, you know, that uh, to bear with them and give us reasons why the elections were postponed. And at the same time, you know, <coughs> to also brief us on the, the, their next uh, steps. Because uh, believe me, this is a huge loss, a huge problem to the uh, country and to even, like he mentioned, the international uh, observers. Uh, so many groups set up situation rooms. They have spent so much money putting logistics together to you know, get the results and then to get uh, uh, information from obser observers posted to different uh, states, different uh, polling units across the country. So bringing those people back will be a huge money. The observers, uh, foreign observers will be now thinking, are they going back or staying back? Whichever way they are going to spend heavily. And I think uh, some people, like I was discussing with um, my driver when I was coming, and he said, Auntie, don't you think that this was done so that the foreign observers will leave, considering, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, what's been going on? And uh, that got me thinking, you know, so there are so many ways to analyze this and understand it. We need INEC to come out and be right. more open. That, that's, uh, that's the same question we'll put to uh, uh, Dr. Sharif Ghali Ibrahim. In the absence of any official, of, I mean, <laughs> communication, you know, rumors thrive. Mm. Speculations take over, mm. and that is what we're likely to see between now and hopefully two, two o'clock, three o'clock later on, when the real details will be out. Mm. Uh, you see, Cyril, uh, I had the IDEC chairman, you know, speak on the air as I was coming here. So the first thing, apology, you mm. know, because all you know, stakeholders were ready for these elections. If you see, you know, graduates, those corpus, you know, who had already prepared, I saw them stranded, mm -hmm. like from where do we start again, yeah. you know? People traveled to come to this particular place, you know, left all places just to do this, you know, clarion call, to answer the clarion call, but finally disappointed. The first thing I should do should apologize to Nigerians. Apology first. That is one. Even though there might be, if it is not a kind of a security issue that must not be revealed to Nigerians, but each and every reason that contributed to the postponement of this election should also be delivered. 
be divulged to Nigerians and all necessary stakeholders. This is, this is one. Then secondly, INEC must get to a level of preparations beyond the usual tradition, i.e., you should produce more electoral materials that even if such materials are missing in a state, you should be able to redeploy such materials for the conduct of these elections. That is two. Then number three, emergency situation. Assuming that we have one or two hours to elections, and election materials are missing in a local government or state, there should be emergency transportation system that could convey election materials to any location, any village in Nigeria. If you have helicopters, add more helicopters to deal with this. Then number four, I pray and hope that the elections will not be postponed again. All right. Okay, well, let's give Anik the benefit of the doubt. It must definitely have been uh, a situation that they didn't have any other choice than to postpone. So what would you say to the political parties, the contestants, and the electorate at the end of the day? Because the elections, hopefully, will still hold in a week's time. Okay, for me, I will concentrate more on the electorates. I will, you know, ask them to please come out again to vote. I know they have made arrangements to vote today. They should not allow the postponements, you know, to deter them from uh, voting. You have uh, taken time to collect your PVCs. You have taken time to travel to your uh, places of um, voting. Uh, let this not be a hindrance. Please, let us still have our people come out to vote, especially the women. We said that this election will be decided by women and the youth. Please, the women and the youth should also not uh, uh, have that apathy of not going out. I am using this medium to call out our people to say, next Saturday, please, let us all go out and vote. All right. Dr. Gary Ibrahim, to the political parties, their candidates, their supporters, what would you say to them? The political parties should reconsider peace accord again. Because this is a discouragement, of course, and it must have started raising some dust, you know, in the minds of the political parties or the politicians. So I think they should consider, you know, agreement in the peace accord again, so that not to raise any other issue in the aftermath of the elections. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, even though we cannot really revert, you know, the outcome of the postponement, because as she said, definitely some people will develop apathy, return, you know, back to their various destinations and not to vote again. The only thing we'll do is that as Nigerians, uh, the spirit of democracy that has already entered you, you shall be persistent and determined, not let it go again. And uh, another issue is that uh, uh, the issue of the apathy, we say, is that uh, there is a kind of... Uh, clash of ideology and understanding, especially in southeastern Nigeria. Yesterday I watched the IPOP video going into the street warning voters not to come out to vote, you know, today. I think this situation also has to be dealt with, you know. Uh, if somebody is willing to exercise his own franchise, that is to say free and fair elections, you have the freedom to vote and you have the freedom to be voted for franchise, you know. Uh, so. Uh, this situation, I think the security operatives also ha you know, must consider this. Nobody should be uh, forced to stay at home if he's willing to come out you know, to cast his own vote. And I believe uh, this will not be allowed to hold. Uh, if people are willing to come out to exercise their own franchise, they should be allowed to do that, except if there is a security situation, you know, that that could be prevented. But not an organization whatsoever nomenclature it bears to try to disenfranchise people, you know, by any uh, intimidation, sort of intimidation, or any uh, motive, you know, to be attached to the elections. So these are my submissions. All right, uh, AIG Jitubo, your last word. I want to reassure everybody that one, the police is their friend. And uh, we are going to remain very, very professional, non-partisan, 
and very neutral. And besides, we are, we are watching the back of everybody, and that does and that does not mean that anybody should break the law. If you break the law, the law, the police will, 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 is going to deal with you decide, decisively. Everybody should go about their normal business and continue with their with their lives. All right. So at this point, I'd like to thank you, AIG Moses Jitubo, AIG Investment, Nigeria Police Force Headquarters. Okay, Thanks for it. All right. Yeah, the alumnus oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 of the National Institute. Yes. All right, well, okay. Well, and uh, Dr. Sharif Gali Ibrahim of the Department of Political Science, University of Abuja, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And uh, again, big thank you to a very effective election observer and analyst. Um, you still, you still have, <laughs> you still have some more work to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a week away. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we say thank you to you too. This is where we conclude this broadcast on Nigeria Decides. I'm Cyril Stober. Enjoy your weekend. Mm -hmm.